conference. This is a conference that leaves nobody cold sort of in this room, not only because of the temperatures that we have here in Berlin, but because of the subject that we are discussing here. Yesterday was a day to of providing information. You could also talk about an autopsy that we made. Ralf Fuchs made some important comments to round off the day yesterday. Today, we would like to delve into the details regarding challenges of new military technologies. And we would also like to elaborate concrete policy recommendations. This morning, we would like to discuss challenges of new military technologies from international law and disarmament policy perspectives. We have renowned experts from the United States and Germany to discuss that issue. Now, unmanned systems, how are they to be assessed from international law? Can international law be applied to asymmetrical conflicts? Where does the war zone start and where does it end? These are just a few questions of the kickoff panel that Dr. Niklas Schoenig, the senior research fellow at the Peace Research Institute, is going to chair. They will also try to discuss what conclusions in terms of rules and sanctions can be drawn from those challenges, have to be drawn, um, challenges that emerge as warfare is changing. What is also important is the question of whether existing control regimes and rules are sufficient. And then we will have parallel forums and we will delve into the details regarding those questions and we hope that we will get answers to those challenges. At 11 a.m. we have specific aspects of new technologies and future deployment scenarios and the question is can we stop or put an end to technological progress? Will there be more alternatives than just stopping that, something like preventive policy. And then we have the cyber forum. It is about cyber war and cyberspace in electronization, digitization and automation, both in the civil and the military spheres. In that forum, we will ask whether the use of the cyberspace has to be stemmed or has to be totally prevented when it comes to warfare. So is the destabilization of states via mouse clicks the future of warfare? In forum number three, forum on technology, we are asking how do new forms of conflict and technology influence each other? How high is the likelihood that autonomous systems will prevail in the future? Will we really always have human beings that make decisions on killing, or will those decisions be made by machines? In the early afternoon, until 3 p.m., we dare a summary and an outlook. We dare make a summary and outlook on the question of containing high-tech weapons in international political frameworks. As a political foundation, we are dealing with the question of what role policy plays when it comes to dealing with those new technologies. What role should Germany play at the international level? One aspect will also be whether conventions on the avoidance of certain operation tactics will result in technical limitations or an outlawing of unmanned aerial systems. Is that necessary? Is it political feasible? Everybody knows that these are two different things. I wish all of us a fruitful conference. We are trying to make a contribution to well-informed decision-making. Hopefully, we can cope with the challenges regarding peace and security in times of drones, robotics, and digital warfare. We want to try to close the gaps that currently exist in debates, and we try to pave the way for political decisions of tomorrow. Thank you to you. Thank you to the panelists. And I would now like to ask the chair to come up on stage and continue.
Well, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, also from my side. We closed with ethical questions yesterday, and I have the impression that as regards some or many of those ethical questions, the international law experts could have given us answers by simply referring to international law. Having said that, I would say that we focus on international law right now, and I would like to ask the panelists to come up on stage. So here again, we have a very high-ranking panel. We have Daphne Eviatar here. She's a lawyer and journalist and senior counsel in the Law and Security Program of Human Rights First. This is a non-profit, non-partisan international human rights organization headquartered in Washington, D.C. and New York. She focuses on the American reactions to terrorism, and she also specializes in the legitimacy of targeted killings. Those who would like to know more about her, she runs a blog with the Huffington Post. To my left, I would like to introduce Dr. Jürgen Altmann. He is a physicist and peace researcher at the Technical University of Dortmund. Jürgen Altmann, since the 1980s, has been dealing with technology issues that have implications on peace policy. And he picked up issues that the public did not even know about. Nanotechnology, for instance, is one of those subjects. He checked nanotechnologies with regards to their peace policy implications. He's also the deputy spokesman of the International Committee for Robot Arms Control, ICREC. To your very right, we have Professor Klaus Recht, Chris. He is director and he's professor for, instant, for international criminal law, and he's also the director of the Institute for International Peace and Security Law at the University of Cologne. He was the deputy head of a division in the Ministry of Justice, so he gained practical experience. And I can recall that he was one of the first international lawyers who clearly had a position who said international law needs to be addressed when it comes to drones. So he triggered a very technical and sober debate on this subject. So this is our panel. The idea was to give all panelists a chance to make brief statements from their perspective. So there's international law and disarmament policy and military robotics. And I would like to suggest that we start from right to left. And so, Professor Chris, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I have seven minutes, so I cannot offer more than buzzwords. I would like to mention three points. First of all, sketching and criticizing the U.S.-American policy of targeted killing of al-Qaeda members. Secondly, a few considerations on the question of do we need a new international law regarding asymmetrical wars? And then a few words about the German debate when it comes to the acquisition of strike drones. Okay, as regards the U.S.-American policy, since 2001, this policy has changed with different nuances. Now, since 2013, the latest, we can justifiably say that it, they have a clear international law position that you can deal with and that you have to deal with. Two levels of the American policy need to be addressed, sort of two pillars. The reason vis-a-vis -vis the states where they conduct targeted killings unless there is a consent of the respective state, focuses on the demand and right of self-defense. That includes non-state armed attacks. 
and it allows the use of military violence, according to an American understanding, on the territory of those states that are either unwilling or unable to do something against those non-state armed aggressors. The Americans, since 9-11, the Americans say that there is a non-state permanent attack of al-Qaeda, the non-associated forces, and they say that it is necessary to have those armed attacks wherever they have al-Qaeda fighters. Second level, justification vis-a-vis -vis the individual person that is to be killed. The Americans believe that they are in a non-international armed conflict of a transnational dimension with al-Qaeda. And this conflict, according to the belief of the United States, has started in 2001. And we also have so-called associated forces plus the al-Qaeda fighters. In the context of such a conflict, the United States say that they are entitled to targeted killing of those al-Qaeda fighters that are permanently involved in those combat actions. And for those combat actions, there should not be any time limits. So those who permanently are involved in combat actions, say the Americans, can be fought against permanently. And they can do it wherever those fighters are. There are no geographical limits. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I, when it comes to the American position, I basically agree with them in two quite controversial points. I believe, like the Americans, that there is a right of self-defense against non-state armed attacks. So I think there is such a right. Of course, it depends on the exact conditions and prerequisites. And secondly, I see international law developments of the last decades also in a way that a transnational dimension of a non-international armed conflict can no longer be ruled out in principle. So the term non-international armed conflict that was introduced in international law in 1949 cannot be limited to a classical civil war situation. So these two points of departure, both are controversial. I mean, in those two points, I agree with the Americans. However, I believe, and this is where my criticism starts, I believe that the Americans in the post-Afghan phase of enduring freedom, that is the phase when the United States started to pursue the policy of targeted killing and expand them to states beyond Afghanistan, so that Ameri the Americans have sort of overdone those two pillars. The right of self-defense was expanded too much because the concept of non-state armed attack was interpreted in a very wide way by the Americans. If in Yemen, in Pakistan or Somalia, this right of self-defense should be exercised vis-a-vis -vis those states. So if they say that they can, or if they say that there is massive transnational state violence, similar to 9-11, then they can act. And I think that the Americans have not even tried to provide evidence for those activities. They just generally claim that there is a challenge by an ongoing non-state armed attack without providing further substantial reasons. At the level of conflict international law, my criticism is that the American policy silently did not comply with the high demands regarding the existence of a non-state international conflict. They sort of watered it down. After the Afghan phase, so after the expulsion of al-Qaeda from Afghanistan, they automatically assumed that al-Qaeda fulfilled the two major prerequisites that have to be there in order to talk about a non-international armed conflict, which is 
a military-like structure. And ever since the moment where Al-Qaeda became a terror network of transnational dimension, this is everything but secure. I would rather have doubts here. And secondly, that Al-Qaeda as an organization is a transnational armed threat of an intensity degree. And here I would really raise the yardstick. So the intensity is so high that it requires military defense instead of the criminal law and a human rights-based defense. So these are my general concerns. And we can, of course, discuss the details in our discussion. Second point, do we need a new international law for asymmetrical wars? Well, in principle, I would say no. At the moment, I don't believe that there is a legitimate national security concern which could not be solved with the model of transnational non-international armed conflict rules on the one hand. And on the other hand, which is even more important, it is a very important demand to international law politics to act at the high threshold of applying rules of non-international conflicts. And there was a sort of, sort of the, the limits blurred or got blurred, which means a reduction of the war threshold at the expense of peace based on human rights conventions. So what we need here is a change of perspective with regards to what we lovingly call humanitarian international law. Humanitarian international law, in terms of the concept, is a euphemism, at least partially. It would be, analytically speaking, clearer, even though Germans don't like that, to talk about the right to armed conflicts, because that would clearly show that when applying humanitarian international law, you do not only have blessings, the applicability of certain humanitarian protection standards, but in particular, and this has become very clear in the last years, the entitlement of states to fight, including targeted killings, to have the right to fight, that sort of overlap the strict human rights regulations. In a state of peace, and I don't think that anybody doubts that targeted killings are practical ruled out. In the very moment where states are in a non-international, non-state international armed conflict, they do that not because they want to bring blessings to the population, but because they get a tool to reduce human rights obligations. As a consequence, it is important that the simple hypothesis that humanitarian international law should be applied as far and as much as possible to counteract this hypothesis is hypocritical. Now that those contexts have become clear, we have to make sure that even the non-international armed conflicts remains what it should be remain a total exclusion. It's just a legal emergency regime. So if this legal emergency regime has been achieved because, by way of exception, the limit to non-state international armed conflicts is given, then four questions need to be raised or four issues need to be raised. Firstly, does the United States or is the United States really entitled to use those rights? Are there no geographical borders whatsoever when it comes to such armed conflicts? Or do you, when it comes to the war zone, do we have a sufficient military pre presence of the state organizations where you have targeted killings? Do you have to demand that? Secondly, vis-a-vis -vis the very intransparent actions of the United States, don't we have to select criteria very carefully when it comes to targeted killings? Don't we have to have a much better monitoring system? The Israeli Supreme Court, in its judgment, really put up an interesting list, and I don't really know whether they are reflected in the American practice. Third point, shouldn't 
shouldn't we comply with the demand of the International Red Cross? Shouldn't we think about that demand? Whether in the territories that are under the control of the state conflict party, there is a premise of arrest before killing based on the principle of military necessity. The demand of the International Red Cross was really rejected very strongly by militaries. However, I don't believe that the last word has already been spoken. So if you take this issue seriously, i.e. whether the military necessity obliges states in certain situations to do without killing and arresting people instead, then, if we are honest, we can not circumvent the hard question of how should those people be arrested. And this would be a prevented arrest regime in an armed conflict. Otherwise, you run the risk of being hypocritical, referring to arresting people, but not having a real arresting regulation regime. This is definitely a desire because the right to non-international armed conflicts does not imply that question. So a regulation would be possible here, but that would not be a comprehensive new compre convention. It would be an improvement of the current situation. Last sentence regarding the German situation when it comes to the purchase of combat drones. I would pledge for a distinction or a separation of that discussion with the discussions that I have just made that is uh, dealing with U.S. American policies. I am really confident and I place trust in German politics or policies that if they will purchase strike drones, they will be used in the context of international law and not against international law. That means that the fact that the United States uses combat drones to a great extent against international law is not an argument for Germany to say, okay, we are not going to purchase those strike drones as a consequence. The reasons for such a prohibition would have to be separated from the United States situation. Whether those reasons exist, I would like to discuss with you. Thank you, Professor Kress. Thank you, Professor Kress. Daphne, please, can I ask you to take the floor? Hi, good morning. Um, thank you. I, I largely re agree with most of those remarks, including about the, the U.S. position. Um, I, I'm going to summarize uh, to some extent. I mean, there's controversy within the United States about how the, the United States is conducting its – is using drones. And, and when I speak about drones, I'm speaking about remote, remotely operated vehicles, not autonomous vehicles that are acting on their own. So that's really a, quite a different issue, I think, legally. Um, and, and the view – I'm also not representing a broad human rights view. There's disagreement among human rights organizations within the United States about how this issue should be approached. But I, I would say that from the perspective of Human Rights First, which is uh, somewhat more uh, pragmatic organization, let's say, um, we tend to – we actually think that the use of drones is, is lawful in armed conflict. Um, there's nothing inherent about drones, as, as was discussed on some of the panels yesterday. There's nothing inherent about drones that would make them illegal. Uh, it's obviously – and targeted killing is something that is acceptable in an armed conflict. It's obviously better than indiscriminate killing. And so there's nothing inherently wrong with that. I think the problem – the difficulty with the U.S. position is there's a lot of confusion about where is there an armed conflict? What is the scope of that armed conflict? Um, in – you know, within an armed conflict under international humanitarian law – the United States and, and any uh, country in war can target the enemy armed forces of, um, of, the, of the opposition or civ civilians while they're direct directly participating in hostilities. Outside of an armed conflict, lethal force is only acceptable in self-defense, and that's in response to an imminent threat to human life. The problem with the United States operations is, first of all, a lack of information about how they're applying these laws. So they will say they, are, they operate consistently with international humanitarian law. 
They uh, don't disagree that that applies. However, they interpret it in a very uh, broad way, and we don't exactly know how they interpret it because there's a whole set of legal memos that have been written by the Justice Department about how to interpret the relevant laws, and they're not public. So we don't have access to any of them. We don't really know how it's being interpreted. Um, We also don't have any facts about who is actually being killed why are they being killed? On what basis is the basis because we're in an armed conflict with those individuals or because they pose an imminent threat? There's no information. And we're, we're talking about thousands. There are estimates, some estimates of 4,700 people killed by drones, and that was from a U.S. senator. So it's a large number of people to not know on what basis they're being killed. Um, now, the... I'm just going to point to a couple of particular problems that I have with, and I think the human rights community in the United States generally has with the way that the United States has interpreted the laws of armed conflict um, and international human rights law. And first, in terms of the laws of armed conflict, the U.S. has said that within an armed conflict, it can target any members of al-Qaeda, the Taliban, or associated forces. Now, first, there's the obvious problem that we don't know who associated forces are. That's also secret, right? That's classified information. So we ha- the United States has not publicly defined the enemy. But even within that, it's not true that you can target any member of those groups. You can only target members of the armed forces of those groups or individuals who are performing a continuous combat function with those groups. That's a huge difference. So... The United States has taken the position that it can legally target someone who is simply assisting those groups, maybe acting as a courier or a cook or a driver, and that really stretches the bounds of international law. So that's one problem in terms of armed conflict. Now, as we're moving away from uh, the classic armed conflict, as we withdraw combat troops from Afghanistan, there's this question, and certainly in terms of the issue of drones, they're being used increasingly outside of armed conflict zones. So what's the justification for that? And the United States, again, has not said clearly whether the justification is this much broader view of where the armed conflict is, although it has said that the armed conflict is with al-Qaeda and associated forces, wherever they may be. But President Obama has recently also said, well, he's referred to outside zones of conflict or traditional zones of conflict. And And there, the government has said, we will only target operational leaders of al-Qaeda who pose a continuous and imminent threat to the United States. Now, the problem is we don't know how they're defining an operational leader, and we don't have access to any of the information that they use to define who is an operational leader. And the idea of a continuous and imminent threat is not clear, because normally... When you talk about an imminent threat, it means immediate, immediate and specific. You know that there is a threat, that someone is about to launch an attack. You know who is about to launch it, where that attack is, approximately when it's going to happen. That's not what they're talking about. And U.S. officials have publicly and also in secret memos and uh, white papers that were leaked to the media defined imminence in a much broader way. They talk about an elongated concept of imminence or a flexible concept of imminence, which means not an immediate attack, but just that they have reason to believe that this person poses a threat. It doesn't have to be a threat of a specific attack or a specific time when that attack will happen. And in fact, they've um, identified imminence as more, when is the win- do we have a window of opportunity to kill this person? So for example, we know this person is traveling right now in Pakistan or in Yemen We um, have them under surveillance. There's a drone that we could use to kill them. That's a window of opportunity that makes it, under this view of imminence, lawful even outside of an armed conflict. That, I think, is a very dangerous stretch of international law because then you're not talking about imminence and self-defense. You're talking about windows of opportunity to kill suspected terrorists. And again, you know, the U.S. will say, well, we have a preference for capturing them or we have a preference for having you know, a, a partner country arrest them, arrest the suspected terrorists, but often that's not possible. And yet we know that in Yemen, for example, for, there have been a number of cases where someone has been openly living in a community, could have been arrested, but was actually killed by a drone strike. So again, it's not clear when the United States says it's not feasible to capture someone, is it just that they don't want to put U.S. troops in any, at any risk, Or how are they defining feasibility is the question. So um, I 
I guess I want to point out, I guess these are the two major legal problems that I see, is the definition of who is targetable within an armed conflict and this very flexible concept of of who poses an imminent threat and can be killed, um, can be the subject of a targeted killing by a U.S. drone. Um, In terms of... uh, I think one of the big problems and one of the big issues that we are pushing for is not necessarily for new laws that govern the specific issues, largely because in the United States, new laws that have to go through Congress tend to be worse than the old laws that we have. So having spent a lot of time in Washington, you generally don't want to go there for a new law. Um, but what we what we do want to see is more transparency from the U.S. government. And I think... There was some, a lot of discussion yesterday on the panels about in a democratic society how uh, you know killing and, and applica- the uh, ability to follow the law is really checked by a democracy. You don't really have a functioning democracy if the executive branch doesn't provide any information to the public, right? And, and even if it provides select bits of information to select people in Congress secretly – that's really not accountability because then those people in Congress are not held accountable by the public. And so really the only way this kind of democratic system works is if there's more information. We need to know who's being killed, why are they being killed, under what legal theory, how many people are being killed, how many are civilians, how many are combatants, how are you defining who is a combatant. There's a big problem in the sense that the United States talks about militants. They say, oh, we killed this number of militants. And then the media will report... We, they killed, you know, X now, 15 al-Qaeda militants. Well, what does that mean? If these people were in Yemen, they might have been local insurgents who are not fighting the United States. They might be militants to the Yemeni government, but they're not necessarily legitimate targets for the United States. So a lot of questions. Um, I'll wrap up. But the, I think that the, what a lot of us are pushing in the United States, really, with the government and trying to use the law to push is for more transparency. And to some extent, we're slowly getting a little bit more information. And I would just um, echo the, the idea that I don't think we need new laws. I think we just need to comply with the laws that exist. Thanks. Yeah. Vielen Dank. J- Jürgen Altmann. Thank you, Jürgen Altmann. Good morning, on my behalf as well. I've jolted down six points that I'd like to outline to you, and they more go towards disarmament policy and less towards international law, and we heard about international law by two people already. The first statement is that if you hear the word international law, you what comes to your mind is war international law, human humanitarian international law, but there's also general international law, especially peace securing law and disarmament law. And Peace, international law and disarmament international law are not always parallel. Sometimes they are competing with one another. And when you argue that drones allow for more targeted assaults, then you might be enthusiastic about drones, but you might have a higher probability of war being waged. And if such a conflict is thinkable, then the priority should be at first to prevent a war from happening and not only to focus on war, international law, and um, enhance its application in war itself. Second point, new military technology, as it was mentioned as a topic for this conference, is often connected to a combat benefit and advantage already in history. Think of uh, firearms and spares and arch bows. So sometimes they've been decisive to decide a war. So ever since World War II, the important military states have used science and research in a systematic way to drive new technologies in the Cold War and even after. And it's going to become paradigmatic in the declared goal of the U.S. Ministry of Defense, where um, new developments of research and technology for new technologies makes for supremacy, decisive supremacy to prevail over any enemy on the battlefield. This is a quote. And you might wonder whether this is a realistic option to be able to prevail over any enemy on uh, the battlefield. Uh, Please think of larger coalitions against the US US and wars that have not been won against the US. But this is the explicit goal, at least. And possibly this is a basic problem of international security. So point. 
new military technologies can make war more likely, objectively speaking, on the military side, because the pressure to strike fast in the face of a crisis or a situation of threat increases. And in the Cold War, with the transition of the bomber that took eight or nine hours to fly from the US to the Soviet Union and vice versa, so the transition from the bomber to the inter continental missile that only took 30 minutes, well, this is what happened. And it happened also when we moved away from just having one explosive on a missile to three or ten nuclear mis uh, warheads on a missile. And the same thing goes for missile defense shields. So whenever a new technology increases the threat of both sides and increases the pressure to react more swiftly, then there'll be less time to reflect upon things and to scrutinize whether there has been a wrong alarm or whether something misleading had happened when you have to launch your rockets within 10 minutes under a imminent threat, then you can launch a nuclear war because of a, an erroneous message or alert. And there are many examples of the Cold War where this almost happened. So now for the missiles we have today, maybe this is no longer that urgent, but you can think about the same thing for fleets of strike drones that um, are opposing each other in a conflict situation, um, If unless the situation is very asymmetrical, where one side has full freedom, supremacy in the airspace to observe air sovereignty, to observe and to monitor but there is also the subjective and political side to it, the way peace researchers put this forward in a repeated way. The question as to whether we can expect many dead soldiers in a war and whether we can decrease this number by sending drones, then the temptation to use force, military force, is way higher. And yesterday somebody mentioned that you can hardly imagine that Pakistan would tolerate manned uh, fighter planes in Pakistan or in Waziristan, but the drones can be silently tolerated, so to speak. Next point. When new military technology becomes dangerous, and if it can become dangerous, then everything speaks for limiting them from the outset by international agreements. This is the only way to do it, because if you feel threatened by military technology, you've got motives to build them up uh, as well. So you have to have rules and limitations. This is called preventive arms control. Somebody mentioned the buzzword. And you might think that this is all future and science fiction fantasies. But there is one example of existing treaties that bans on the development of new technologies, not only the use and the positioning, but also the development and research and trial out for B and C weapons and laser weapons. The use was banned, but later on also research and development was banned. The non-proliferation treaty, which is no longer in force, um, unfortunately also placed a ban on the research and development of these missiles. Next point. We might wonder what will happen in the next 10 to 20 years. And I'm grateful for the contribution of Peter Singer of yesterday, who mentioned a great deal of examples and a couple of examples when talking about cyber war. The question is, who plays a role in there? And we're talking about autonomous weapons and autonomous decision-making systems that can fight battles in an operative way, at least in space, but then at some point also on the Earth and in the airspace. And we're talking about tiny systems that can intrude somewhere and maybe um, launch a bomb in somebody's ear uh, or target a politician. And we're talking about the possibility to build something at home in a 3D printer and to turn a highly active weapon out of it, or you can build a micro robot so that arms control and preventive arms control become more and more urgent today. But on the other hand, the political situation is not very beneficial and for it at the moment. But when advocating 
nuclear weapons limitations, President Obama showed some positive approaches, some small positive approaches, and we might have a prospect of having a ban on autonomous weapons as well in the future. This will maybe be the next step in five or ten years' time. Next point, last point, I think that there should be an observation and monitoring of the military technology progress in inverted commas so as to contain the most dangerous developments and ban them. But here the US saw the major problem. They spend two-thirds of their budget for military research and development, and they have not become aware of the fact that in the medium term and by the proliferation of them, they um, increase their proper their, their own threat against them. But the question arises whether arms control is still able to contain threats by military technology because if uh, control and inspection options have to be carried out uh, for everybody who has a computer in his home, uh, then maybe the military and the industry would no longer accept uh, this. And we've, we had one example for the protocol on the Biological Weapons Convention that failed in 2001. So it might happen to us that in 15 or 30 years down the road, uh, arms control cannot provide for international security because it doesn't, if it doesn't even take place because of the unsolved verification and checking problem. And then we might have an arms race with a lot of instability where sub-state or individual players play important roles or where humanity learns to get organized in a better way, just like democratic states use a monopoly of legitimate force um, and where security is no longer provided for by having uh, armed forces. But the European Union shows the way we could go. The establishment of international authorities like international courts of law Everything of the like should be supported. But when starting thinking about drones, tiny weapons, and cyber war, then I think we cannot go around this perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Jürgen Altmann. Thank you, Jürgen Altmann. Okay, so before we open the discussion, I would like to ask some questions to the panelists first. Let me summarize one thing, and then I would like to ask you to tell me whether that summary was correct. If I understood the two of you correctly, the international law experts, the use and operation of unmanned remote-controlled drones in the context of an armed conflict, be it an international or a non-international one, is unproblematic in terms of international law. So if we talk about drones, we have to recognize that international law is not or does not have any problems at this level. Is that the right summary? Please just highlight that or confirm that, because that is a very important aspect. We clearly have to distinguish between where a drone is used and the question, and this is then for the next round here, the question of what is done with a drone? Is it autonomous? Is it remotely controlled? And that would be an issue that I would like to raise again to our two international law experts. I have only got an answer to the question of is autonomy justified and okay in terms of international law? They say, well, we don't have autonomy, and we international law experts only talk about what exists. So I am hoping that I might get an answer from you here. So what does international law stipulate? What degree of human influence has to be given or is required? Or is international law silent when it comes to those questions? Another question to the international law experts. If there is agreement that targeted killings of the United States do not comply with governing international law. How can practice or how can we then change the international common law? And what about the silence of the Europeans? Do they sort of tolerate that? I mean, when it comes to the UK, when it comes to the UK, I heard that intelligence intelligence was made available, that was then used for some targeted killings. Let's assume that this was right. We cannot prove it. 
However, we cannot prove the opposite either. Let's assume that this is correct. Wouldn't that mean that the UK supports this practice? And what can this lead to? So those were my questions to the international law experts. And to Jürgen Altmann, I have another question. You talked about verification, the verification issue, which increases when software becomes even more complex, when automated systems become even more complicated. But how do we deal that verification problem? Is it unsolvable? And do we just have to hope to establish standards that have an impact at the normative level, but that can no be longer be verified? So these are my questions. And Daphne, would you like to start? Um, in terms of your first uh, point about whether we were saying that drones are inherently just fine under international law and not problematic, although... In, in some respects, they are just another weapons platform. I do want to qualify that in the sense that because, at least by the United States, they're used so secretly, it is very difficult to hold the government accountable for, for example, civilian casualties. So it's difficult to know if the, if the government – and there's an argument to be made that it doesn't comply with international law because you cannot know whether – um, the killing is proportionate, right? Whether the a, a disproportionate number of civilian casualties um, are resulting because it is secret and also because we don't have troops on the ground in the places where being, people are being killed. So there's no way to verify who was a civilian or who was an actual combatant. So that's a qualification. Um, I would say it's not a big focus of the legal debate in the United States, but I do. It is certainly something that's come up, come with, the, come up with the UN Special Rapporteurs, and I think it's certainly uh, worth discussing this question of because drones are used in this secretive way, um, is there any way to hold the government accountable? Um, in terms of the degree of human influence required under international law, I just don't think that the laws were written at a point where anyone thought that there would be no human influence. Um, in terms of automated weapons, so I can't really answer how I, we might need new law in that area um, to to know to what degree you have to have a human involved in in the actual targeting or actual uh, kind of pulling the trigger, so to speak. And your third point about if targeted killings don't comply with international law, if the U.S. targeted killings, what can you do? I think. Again, that's a tough question in part because of the secrecy, in part because the United States says, well, we just interpret international law differently than everybody else in the world does, and they're wrong. So it's, it's hard to come up against that. On the other hand, I think the fact that the U.S. counts very heavily on its allies, Germany, the U.K., many others, for uh, intelligence on counterterrorism gives all of these countries leverage points to press the United States to say, you have to comply with international law. You have to demonstrate that you're complying with international law. So I do think there's a lot of pressure that European countries that we do count on very heavily can, put, can place on the United States, and, and certainly we would hope to see that. Vielen Dank. Professor Kress. Professor Kress. First question. Yes, you are right. The use of combat drones is not inherently against international law. It can, and you have to honestly say that it can in certain situations compared with other weapon human rights perspective. When it comes to the demands to conflict international law, demands are much lower. This would be rather an international a political issue, and this is what both of us have said whether you should not advocate for more transparency when it comes to those instruments. But you have to distinguish between Lex Lata and Lex Ferenda. No, silence and international common law, that is the next topic. Not in a simple sense that silence in one specific case could change international law, but there is silence. And we, also, we are dealing with an American practice which did not emerge overnight. And it's not only two months old either. It is a practice which has been there for many, many years. So there would have been enough time for those who are or who have general or less general concerns to share this concern and criticism. Those 
when it comes to international law. And we cannot say that there's not a broad discussion on drones internationally. So if you stay silent, if you don't clearly say what you want, then you send out a signal which runs the risk of being drifted into the corner of acquiescence. This is what international law experts say. So this is a new interpretation process of international law that actually nobody wants or these people do not want. For European governments, this means sometimes it's diplomatically speaking difficult, if you have a certain conviction which is different from the conviction or belief of an ally, then you have to balance that. If you always focus on diplomacy, then this can have a certain price that you have to pay. I talked about military necessity. This could be an important point. The Social Democrats in Germany launched an inquiry regarding the drones and the use of drones. They asked the federal government, what do you think about that? And it wouldn't have been so courageous from the perspective of the federal government because the International Red Cross Committee, which is sort of an unsuspected ally, also submitted that inquiry. So those who read the answer carefully will see that the federal government tried to circumvent that question. So this is an example how you do not influence international common law. Last point, autonomy. Well, here I have to make the caveat, especially Noel Sharkey and other renowned colleagues are here. I am still trying to find or form my opinion on that. Therefore, I have to be a little careful here. I don't want to duck your question, though. I mean, I believe that it would be very important if we talk about fully automated or automated weapons systems, it would be very important to distinguish. From an international law perspective, it makes a huge difference whether we talk about the Iron Dome, the Israeli principle, where I don't see that there is any inher anything inherently against international law and the implications of the use of this tool are very remarkable. And then war robotics and robots that can make decisions themselves regarding the target that they want to attack in the context of a policy of targeted killings. As, it, as regards this last category for a control regime, we would have to ask, are we already there to really have a clear legal distinction between these two. So for this last category, I have to say that I feel quite concerned. Not only do I feel concerned, but this raises questions at two different levels. First level goes way beyond the legal level. The special rapporteur against extrajudicial killings posed that question quite rightly. So irrespective of conflict, international law and disarmament law, don't we have to ask the question whether when it comes to delegating decisions to machines, we will achieve a point where this delegation is immoral against human rights per se, because decisions about death and life are made and they are made no longer by human beings, but by machines. I can't claim that I have competence and knowledge here. When it comes to the legal level, the most important question is, does the hard core of proportionality assessment with regards to accepting civil damage, so not only the quantified discretion or assessment of civil casualties, I mean, depending on the context, a machine can assess that, but this needs to be done in the context of this proportionality assessment. And it needs to be balanced against the question of the concrete military advantage, which can be achieved. And this advantage depends on the context. It depends on many imponderabilities and factors. And it then has to be evaluated and assessed, which can't be made with mathematics. Whether this can be done at the moment, I don't really know. And if they embark upon that path, then we definitely need the complementary question. Don't we have to act beforehand? 
I mean, don't human beings have to make decisions that lead to the activation of those automated machines? What about due diligence standards? What about ultra-hazardous activities? And what about international criminal law? What about liability and accountability mechanisms? Maybe they have to be restructured and redefined because it can't be good that we slide into a situation where international criminal liability uh, isn't there because there is a lack of regimes and mechanisms. But you can see that it's more questions than answers, unfortunately. Well, at least I'm happy that you didn't circumvent that question. You try to answer that question, but obviously international law is open to interpretations and difficult to apply. Jürgen Altmann. Before I come to the question of verification, I would like to say something else. I think that military considerations will result in a situation where autonomous shooting will increase if the international community does not introduce new law that prohibits that. There is the pressure due to rapid reactions. There is the effort to have a whole swarm of combat robots operated by one soldier or just observe the activities of that robots where not each and every individual decision is made and controlled by human beings. There is economic pressure in that direction. And it might be that in a future scenario, communication connections will be destroyed or will be interrupted. So if you're in Nevada or in Berlin, and if you want to remotely control the combat drone, there might be interruptions. Then you can have the drone return or you say this drone has to fulfill its mission and then it will shoot automatically. So the military pressure will increase and will be bigger than the general reservations stemming from international law where you say, okay, actually we would have to consider proportionality, discriminations, etc. but that will not be sufficient in order to put an end to those developments. I think we need a convention which clearly prohibits autonomous shooting with a few exceptions like iron dome or phalanx or other systems which can have or which can defend against missiles that are, for instance, trying to attack a ship. We, when it comes to the International Committee for Robot Arms Controls, tried to define those exceptions and how you can operationalize in order to guarantee that in each and every shooting event, there is a human being behind the decisions. This is what we would like to write into such a convention. And you cannot verify that beforehand. It would be totally unacceptable to have a look at the control software of an armed drone or an unmanned tank. Of course, this software within five seconds could be downloaded or could be could be switched from remotely controlled to automated shooting. So to preemptively assess such a convention is more or less impossible. But the same also applies to other international regulations. Dum Dum is, for instance, not checked either whether they have been stocked. But if there is the observation that an illegal arm was used, then you can return to the committee of the International Red Cross just to find out what happened, or you can go to the UN Security Council and you have other opportunities. Same thing in this case. However, we believe that we need more mechanisms, a cryptographically safe mapping of the whole communication and sensor dates could also be made data that is sent from the combat system, sent back and then downloaded into the system. And this could be codified to make it secure, like the 10 codes when it comes to bank transfers. So you can securely store that in a computer and international organizations that 
were founded for such a convention would have the right to ask for such data. Please give us the data of this or that event. We are concerned that automatics automatic shootings took place there. And then you can verify that afterwards. And then like with other violations of international law, you have the possibility to check whether there was a violation afterwards or not. It comes down to a strong and clear norm or standard. Like the standard saying it is unreasonable to use bioweapons, we should also say that it is unreasonable to use those automatic shooting systems. What is even more difficult when it comes to verification is cyber war. If you wanted to establish limits there, which is absolutely imperative because we have an arms race in the cyber space and this can become very real, leave the virtual world and become very real and respective threats have already been made. If we have this cyber war situation, then we can strike back with nuclear arms, conventional arms. So something definitely has to happen there. However, in order to avoid hacker attacks, the Internet is constantly surveyed and controlled. I mean, we need much more research here, creative thinking. The surveillance and control that is there, that is on the Internet, needs to be used in order to find out whether states clandestinely prepare something. But this is a research topic. As regards the armed drones themselves, the easiest solution in terms of verification would be that any time of unmanned systems should be prohibited. Then you would have something like the convention for conventional armed forces. Do the aircraft still have a possibility for the pilot to get in and out of the cockpit? Do the tanks still have seats for the driver, etc.? As soon as this is no longer given, as soon as the systems are too small, then they have to be deemed illegal. That would be the solution that I preferred. My international colleagues are a little more pragmatic. They say it is impossible to implement that on short notice. And then you have to take a differentiated view. But prohibiting autonomous shooting, I mean, when it comes to this topic, we need quantitative and qualitative checks just to find out whether a country does not have more than 250 big drones and 250 mini drones armed. I mean, this could be checked and inspected with the rules and mechanisms that we have. Neue Herausforderung. Thank you. So these are new challenges for arms control, but there are also approaches as to how this can be tackled. Before your morning coffee loses its effect, I would suggest that we start with questions from amongst the audience. There are some hands that go up straight away. We would like to move from the front to the back, please. My name is Eric Pavlik. I'm an IT specialist. So I'm interested in some of the remarks that have been made here, but let me start out with one question to the two international law experts about a potential parallel. All these automated systems have one essential feature, i.e. I'm making a plan to kill somebody and possibly in a specific targeted or indiscriminate way. And then at some point later in time, in another place, it's going to be executed. Uh, and we had a discussion about landmines a couple of years ago, and landmine fields have the same specificity. So I'm making a plan to kill some people uh, with a military purpose. And, uh, I mean, there was an international law discussion around landmines. How can they be transferred to automatic weapon system? How can this discussion be transferred? This is my first question. Another question I have I was just struck by this verification suggestion by Mr. Altman, and I felt a bit terrified by it because all these verification techniques used in cyberspace are dual-use technologies, i.e. technologies that can also monitor internal democracy or can shift um, internal democratic processes inside a country. So these are monitoring and surveillance technologies that are able to monitor and uh, supervise people that can oppress opposition members 
or spy on them. How can you distinguish between the two? Who would like to go first? I'd like to answer first. Ladies first. In terms of the, the question about automated systems, it's a very good point. There's a, a good, a strong comparison to landmines. Um, the difficulty is that you're going to come up with people, and particularly people in the industry, who create these autom- automated weapons. And I think there's going to be a, there's a lot of pressure to use them from the industry, which is all the more reason to develop norms and standards and treaties governing them now. But that um, that robots are going to, are, can discriminate, right? That they'll have these amazing sensors that can um, determine more, better than human beings who is a proper target or not, and that landmines don't have that. So that will be the the argument that you'll come up against. However, I think there's obviously a very important parallel, and certainly I think that the given the state of this weaponry now, there's there's still an opportunity to regulate in that area, and I, I hope we would see something. Good. You have nothing to add? Okay, all right then. When it comes to the monitoring use, the internet surveillance against hackers and so on, I agree with you, basically speaking, but it takes place anyway. And in part, it is, in, it is part and parcel of uh, a possibility of not being completely disrupted by hackers. And I mean, our government supervises these things, monitors things to detect potential attacks and to switch something off in an emergency situation. And, I mean, you might argue whether this is actually right or wrong or whether the surveillance options given are considered to be too negative. But it all takes place anyway in at present. And my statement was there are options to look at whether states prepare attacks when and at the same time when you look for hackers anyway. But I said that it was a research area that needed further research. It's a difficult question, but we can't just leave it to the militaries for cyber offensives and that are preparing that. So we can't just give leeway to it because this might end up in a dangerous situation. Please introduce yourself. My name is Karsten Gericke. I'm a lawyer. I have two questions to Ms. Iviatar and to Professor Kress. The two of you have outlined that there is no need, for instance, to uh, add complements to the additional protocol or to create new legislation by new treaties and you gave pragmatic reasons saying that these chances of success for the U.S. are very limited. But my question is, can you be more specific about this? I mean, what about current law? Where do you see that there are binding limits to the questions you've raised? So, for instance, Professor Kress, you put forward that the transnational component of the non-international conflict has to be raised. But now the question for me arises, where does the battlefield end? So when we ask who still is a combatant, who's still on the battlefield, when from the point of view of the US, uh, the whole world is the battlefield, I mean, how can you then withdraw from the battlefield So this would be the local component. The same goes at the end of the day for the time component. So when does a combatant still participate in combat actions? And I think that Ms. Eviatar outlined this problem in a very clear way because when delving into the detail, we have to ask who is a legitimate, legitimate target anyway. So... I think in current law there are no sufficiently binding limits accepted by the global community. And if your answer is, well, we have to just live with the existing law, then the question, the next question would be how can then these limits in the law be found and be enforced? Thank you. very justified question. It's an important one. I mentioned one aspect in which I can 
imagine that we need norms and standards that we don't have as yet, which is in the field of arresting people in non-international armed conflicts. And here we have something to look for. And in all the other areas you covered, we think it's desirable to take the existing law and make it more specific by adding new provisions. But it is my impression, and maybe you might contradict this, it is my impression of the international situation that at the moment, when it comes to more specific amendments in treaty law, you won't find a consensus at the moment. So what we have to do is what is foreseen in international law, what is the habit in international law in this respect. You have to go one level lower and look for in more informal standards that can find a consensus. So when it comes to common expectations that can have a stabilizing effect. And this is what's being done in different areas. So there have to be at best very representative informal groups of states where discussions are pursued and engaged in, where non-legal standards and recommendations can be tabled that would then help to make these norms more specific. So let's take what's one example, the Copenhagen process in this arrestation and detention problematics. Well, it did not cover all the issues. It did not resolve everything that I had wanted an answer for, but it is such a process. And getting back to the question and the short statement of my colleague, when it comes to the interpretation and specification of direct participation in combat actions, well, here you've got a different type, which is not unusual in international law, a different type of specification here. The International Committee of the Red Cross, as you may know, has an important role because it adopted an important recommendation that can deliver precisely and exactly what you call for, which is the first type of dogmatization of the combating law in a civil war. Well, it is not quite surprising that some of these suggestions were not welcomed by all the powers, but this recommendation was now turned into a transnational discussion process an interstate discussion process, states that would then have the last word in legislation and not the International Committee of the Red Cross. But the International Committee of the Red Cross triggered this discussion process. And as by now, as per now, regardless of what is disputable, this has led led to a specification and clarification of the legal situation. So many of the criticisms that have been mentioned when um, it comes to the selection of targets for the Americans that I can second here have now emanated from these recommendations of the International Committee of the Red Cross. So you won't be too enthusiastic about my answer, I suppose. But, uh, I mean, this is only the second best solution, but at least on this level there are advances. Would you like to add something? Yes, I, I, I agree that I think, you know, in theory there could be better law and clearer law. I think the problem is that... Um, well, well, two things. First, I would say that the ICRC has, has very, I agree, has played a very important role in helping to clarify what the law is in a non-international armed conflict and when you actually have an armed conflict and don't have an armed conflict. And it's allowed us to say to the United States, look, there is no armed conflict that the U.S. is a party to in Somalia or in Yemen or even arguably in Pakistan. Um, it And the ICRC has been extremely important because actually when you have meetings with high-level lawyers in the Obama administration, they take very seriously what the ICRC says. Now, they don't agree with it, and they'll say they don't necessarily agree with it, but they do feel they have to take it very seriously. And so I think that's important. And I just want to add that in the United States, the, the problem is the discussion when, it talks, when people talk about a new law, a need for clarification of international law, is that there's a, a strong desire to create kind of a hybrid between armed conflict and counterterrorism and, and uh, traditional law enforcement. So that would give the United States more power to conduct law enforcement activities through its military and through the CIA internationally. It would give much more power to a government like the United States to, do, to conduct tar- targeted killings beyond armed conflict. That's why we are really reluctant to argue for development of new law, simply because 
the pressure, at least within the U.S., which is the one using this power right now, using the, this technology, is really in the opposite direction. It's to liberalize targeted killing, not to constrain it. Ja, vielen Dank. Jetzt kommen wir so. Thank you. So now we're slowly wrapping up, very slowly though, and I'd say that we'd accept three more questions. There's one on the aisle in the, and one in the middle, so we're collecting questions, and then we're giving them back to the panel, but please be concise and brief in your questions so that we can deal with that. I'm trying to make it brief. My name is Lukas Hafner. I study politics and law in Munich. My question goes to the two legal experts as well. We heard about this development, i.e. that the U.S. takes the rules that would apply for the use of lethal force in and that they um, apply them and interpret them very flexibly and that this leads to a situation where we might create an international common law which is not desirable in political terms here in Germany. And my question is, what are your recommendations to the German government, for instance, how to cope with that new development? I mean, you said we might use, make use of informal panels to specify the rules that are already there, and you said it would not make sense to make an attempt to find and adopt tough and hard rules that would contain the use of drones. And here I'd like to know what can be alternatives. Thank you. In the front. My name is Johann Schmidt, IFSR. A question to Professor Kress, a very brief one. Thank you very much for these very convincing remarks you've made. My question is the following. In your first point, you refer to the fact that the United States watered down and expanded the interpretation of the self-defense entitlement in the context of the so-called armed conflict and then um, crosses the threshold of or, or increases the threshold of using armed force. But the problem is not military force, but it's a secret service force, so drone attacks in Pakistan and in Yemen. This is no military operation. This is not a war. This is what the CIA carries out. It's a classic intelligence service operation that was always conducted with different means. And my question to you would now be the following. In what sense do the United States need the so-called international armed conflict for legal reasons in order to justify what they do? Or could they do it in a certain sense by qualifying it the way it is, i.e. a secret service operation? Thank you. In the front. People assume that a priori automated um, weapons are um, something with rather doesn't exist unless there are special reasons to permit that. I want to propose the, the opposite argument, that it's a great idea, unless we find out that, the, that the, the terrible problems with it, but we should support it. And here are three quick arguments for that position. The first is that we, we rely on machines and automated systems in any, every other domain of our lives, and we trust these machines completely. We have surgeries, you don't. Okay. So I, I did it a few years ago. I, I took my first trip abroad using a GPS, and I had a map on, on, on my lap, and I, I trusted the machine only when it, when it you know, fit the map. Most of, these, most of us today have complete confidence in the GPS systems, even though we know that sometimes they mislead us. We know, but nevertheless, we trust these machines. So since we trust these machines, when, when, we, when we fly abroad, we know, you know, the, the pilots just sit there and have beer. There are computers that take us abroad. No, no, okay. We, we trust these machines. So it's kind of bizarre to think that in, in this particular domain, they won't be as effective. That's the first argument. The second argument is that, after all, the main legal and moral problem with warfare is the danger of collateral damage, right? That's, that's the main problem. 
And precisely with this problem, these um, automatic, aut aut automated weapons seem to be to provide a great advantage, right? It's not only drones, we talked about it yesterday, but other weapons do. We can program them. Okay, so that's a great advantage. And I think we are sometimes too cynical about U.S. and other countries um, regarding their, their, um, their attitude to collateral damage. I think even from a strategic point of view, these countries have a strong interest to reduce collateral damage. Okay, finally, the third point, which wasn't raised, I think, so far. I think automated weapons have a strong advantage in terms of deterrence. Because you want to cross this fence. So if there's a human being there, so whether that human being shoots at you or not, that depends on the, you know, all kinds of circumstances. And you can talk, maybe talk to the person and convince the person... But when there's an automatic, you know, machine gun over there, and if you cross a line, you're a dead person, you don't cross the line, okay? And if you know that if you fly your aircraft into some geographical zone, the, the, the aircraft is targeted and, and you're dead, you don't do it, or you think twice, okay? So in terms of just, you know, pure deterrence, I think these kind of weapons have an advantage. Ja, vielen Dank, auch für die Thank you so much and thanks for reminding us that we might bring in different perspectives and see the matter differently. I would say that we now go through the questions and link them up with a final statement on your behalf and you can say what is particularly dear to your hearts. Let, let us start the other way around. So we start with Jürgen Altmann. Well, talking about the legal questions, well, I won't really comment on that, them, but this uh, last challenge by Daniel Statman is something I'd like to react to. Yes, if you look at things from a military logics point of view, and if you don't think of the interactions of a military system in an international system, then you have a point, then I'd agree. Yes, deterrence is stronger if you're atom automatically killed by stepping across a line and crashing your plane or flying your plane into a certain zone, but you have to prepare for it. And then you will develop your own automatic systems to counteract uh, these automatic systems of the other side. So it's suppression of enemy air defense, as it's called. And this takes place as we speak. And now when anticipating this as the military, and I'm a peace researcher, so it's not me, but if um, militaries can anticipate this, they have to prepare for it and develop and take all technical, organizational, administrative measures so as to counteract this, so as to suppress these automatic strike devices. And now we get into a classic arms race in a new area, in that case for automa automated weapon systems. So I believe that especially when you think of conflict and crisis situations where automatic systems um, are in an interaction, and this was discussed in the SDI issue, automated defense systems that deter each other in space, but then you would boil it down to the airspace. So let's say on the Strait of Taiwan or uh, somewhere along the borders between India and Pakistan, but what you can think of any other crisis regions, that then some unclear event, a sun reflection would be interpreted as a fire, as a rocket being launched, and you might automatically strike back. This is the disadvantage of automatic weapons. You don't know how they behave in complicated situations, and they interact with one another in a way that can never be completely predicted because the control systems of the other side that um, pilot these swarms of strike drones are not known. And of course, they won't be divulged either, so you can't really try it out. So I think this is a relatively strong counter-argument against the argument that um, the deterrence would be stepped up, and this is why I would need automatic systems at any rate. And when it comes to trusting in automated systems in general life, yes, but we all uh, are aware of the problems. Our German railway system doesn't really um, run the trains on time, and uh, a healthy mistrust in automated systems is not only of the essence, but we've all develop that. But maybe we might say that we trust these systems too much and sometimes we switch off our own minds and brains and some people 
um, where it is said that some people use GPS systems and uh, crash into a river because they didn't even look at what was outside. So this happened. So you should not blindly rely on these machines. So uh, there are good reasons to ban autonomous weapon systems with some small exceptions for systems that are already existing, for instance, for ship and um, air defense. Thank you. Um, I'll just take the questions briefly in order. In, in terms of the, the issue of um, the U.S. is applying the, the rules of lethal force very flexibly and uh, it's creating bad international common law, I think that's absolutely true. I think what Germany and other countries can do to prevent this is to, uh, to, use, to use its leverage, which is to withhold cooperation in counterterrorism actions. Now, obviously, that's a difficult thing, but Germany has done that, for example, in terms of drone strikes in Pakistan, it has with, withheld cooperation, um, refused to provide intelligence to the United States because it objected to, drones, to certain drone strikes in Pakistan. I think more of that is extremely important, if only both as a practical level, but also because we use it as advocates in the United States as part of the, the practical reason for why the U.S. policy on drones and its heavy reliance on drones is not effective. I think that actually... More than law, what works in, in terms of U.S. policymaking is making policy arguments about why it's a bad idea. And I think that the fact, the idea of uh, lack of cooperation among allies because of the way that the U.S. is applying the law or interpreting the law is actually quite a very, it's a very effective practical argument that U.S. policymakers listen to. So I think that is something that um, governments here in Europe can, can really uh, leverage. Um, in terms of the uh, question of does the United States in in international armed conflict need to um, abide by – does it need to, to use the justification of a non-international armed conflict to conduct targeted killings by the CIA? Well, you know, it ne- the United States never really says whether the justification for its actions is – is an armed conflict or self-defense. And that's part of why it doesn't want to say that. It doesn't want to provide information about what law the CIA follows. So if you ask the U.S., they would say, no, we can just say it's an imminent threat. So I think it's a, it's a slippery slope when it comes to the CIA since they provide no information. And in terms of the issue of automated weapons, you know, I mean, I'm glad to have this discussion. I think it's important because there is obviously... It, on its face, it seems like there's great potential for automated weapons to do lots of really effective things and to avoid some of the human error that we see in warfare. I think the problem is that, you know, I mean, I rely on, not, I don't have a GPS system in my car, but I use Google Maps all the time, and I rely on it heavily. I don't really use maps very much anymore when I drive, but it often sends me the wrong way. And it's no big deal if I take the wrong exit or, you know, the, the sign has changed or whatever, and, and I go the wrong way. It's a really big deal if a machine accidentally kills somebody. So the, 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 the problem is the risk is so much higher when you're talking about automated weapons than when you're talking about so many of the other ways that we rely on automated systems. Um, and, and even, you know, in the medical context, yes, there's a lot of robotics used in surgery, all of that, but there's always a person there controlling it. And so I think that's what we're talking about here is making sure that there's always a person there controlling it and able to make those judgments about who is a civilian, who should be killed. You know, you have an automatic, if you're about to cross a line and there's an automatic weapon that could kill you, well, generally that might be really good, but let's say it's a child or a blind person or a civilian who mistakenly is going to cross that line. If there's an actual soldier there holding a gun, they might be able to tell, no, this child is not actually a threat, but the weapon, an automated weapon, wouldn't be able to. So that's where, where those distinctions are really important, and having some human involvement, I think, is, is going to be really important. Um, yeah, that, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. As regards the question of what can Germany do, I mean, quite a few things have already been said, and I subscribe to what has been said. If you have enough knowledge, if you can prove that something goes against international law, then you have to tell your friend that this needs to be banned and stopped. The diplomatic bilateral conversation is very effective, I think. And I want to trust that this, these conversations have been intensively been 
led in the last years. Of course, we don't know all the details, but I have no doubt that the friendly nations talk about differences and different opinions. And we also have other opportunities, be it in the discussion processes that I have sketched or be it in other at other occasions where you have the opportunity to share your international law positions regarding specific important issues. And there might also be parliamentary inquiries. They are also read by other nations. Or another example, it is a slightly different area, but regarding the ratification of the Kampala Amendment on the attack war, I have been dealing with this in last years. The federal government really translated its paper into English for others because this paper contains very important aspects regarding the interpretation of this. This year, we also expect the new edition of the Manual on Humanitarian International Law written by the federal government. This is also an opportunity to discuss specific issues and to also say and tell others what Germany is convinced of. As regards the intelligence services, one preliminary remark. The extent of the commitment of the CIA in terms of international law is unfortunate, mildly put, because, and this has become clear, if you have a look at the commitment of the CIA and compare that with the commitment of U.S. military forces, then transparency is even smaller. I don't focus on specific legal norms here, but there is a clear lack of transparency in this area, and this is always a problem. Second pro point, and that was your question, actually. It is not, isn't it possible to use any of those international law regulations? And, uh, well, isn't it possible to just change the instrument? The ban of using violence says that if there is a reason, if there is no reason, according to international law, to have targeted killings on the territory of another state, irrespective of whether this killing is carried out by the military, the intelligence service, or the police, the ban to use violence, according to international law, is not limited to a specific tool. And equally, it is not important, not, not possible to undermine the regulations of international law because there is a certain form of conflict. And when you ask, do the Americans, also with regards to the CIA, need a distinction, a distinction between peace law and international law? Yes, they do. Because it would be a huge misunderstanding that below the threshold of conflict international law, any intelligence service could operate in a legal free space. If the CIA does targeted killings outside of an armed conflict, according to international law, then I think uh, the CIA needs to be bound by human rights and it has to bear the respective consequences. And the result would be that targeted killings are not possible and allowed. Last point regarding the remarks of our colleagues on automated weapons. I can only say thank you for your statement. As I said, I'm still trying to form my own opinion, to collect arguments and information, despite my sort of problematic gut feeling. The more I think about it, I think that this is a highly complex issue. And please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that uh, possible issues, um, any aspect should be excluded. We have to, of course, balance all the different arguments and aspects, but that it goes into the direction that you have sketched cannot be ruled out. Thank you very much. What is interesting in this context is that in Germany, at least at the official level, uh, we assume that autonomy will not come. So we try to circumvent that debate to a certain degree. Obviously, there are pros and cons that have to be discussed, but those discussions are unfortunately not taking place in Germany. Against the backdrop that we have discussed those issues here, well, I would like to thank the panelists. Thank you for your attention and also for your questions. And I think we all deserve refreshments now. Thank you.